probably sometime when I was about two. I grew up in this crazy bohemian uh, family in Philadelphia, and we actually lived in a public housing project. So definitely one of my earliest memories is having my uh, crazy bohemian mother making strudel on the uh, table in this public housing project and having all of the children running around naked underneath the table eating the scraps from the strudels. So that's a, that was a fairly typical scene in our, uh, in our household growing up. Part of the reason why people got it so wrong about babies for so long was because as adults, when we want to find out what someone's thinking, we ask them and get them to tell us. And that's something that babies and even young children are very bad at doing. So to figure out what babies and young children think, we have to figure out ways to ask them in their language and not ours. So for infants, that means actually looking at what they do, where they look, what, they, what actions they perform rather than what they say. And even for, say, the three and four-year-olds that I study a lot, um, it means getting them to say choose between two alternatives or actually do something rather than, you know, you ask a three-year-old, what are you thinking? And you get this beautiful Blakeian stream of consciousness monologue about their birthday party and horses and all sorts of things. So what we have to do is really rely on actions rather than words, get them to produce actions and also give them information about the problem we are, are um, presenting in terms of real physical objects in their immediate environment. So, for example, we've been doing uh, very exciting work about babies and young children's understanding of statistics. Well, you know, even grown-ups, any grown-up who's taken a statistics class will tell you grown-ups are terrible. I mean, in fact, Danny Kahneman got the Nobel Prize for showing how bad grown-ups are at explicitly thinking about probabilities. But when we take three-year-olds, uh, fortunately, we would never do anything as lunatic as ask them about probabilities, but if we actually give them a real machine that operates according to probabilistic principles and just get them to operate the machine, then you suddenly realize, oh, wait a minute, they actually are implicitly understanding all of the things like, you know, conditional probability. It's always a very big uh, leap to go from any kind of science to clinical cases, because clinical cases are so complicated. But I do think there may be some evidence now that the kinds of, there's a kind of continuum between schizophrenia and, say, creativity. So, you know, schizophrenia seems to be a kind of occupational hazard of poets, for instance. Um, that there seems to be some connections bet between those things, and those seem to be connected with some of the neurological phenomena that we also see with very young babies. Essentially, not having a lot of top-down control, not having... Uh, Typically, for ad, the way the adult brain works and the aspect of the adult brain that adults are most interested in is that the prefrontal region, which is sort of the brain's head office, you know, where the chief executives are, um, a lot of what goes on in adults is that it shuts down big, enormous other parts of the brain. One of the things that happens when you dream, for instance, is that kind of really ferocious control gets lifted. and. Uh, there's a little evidence that, at least with some kinds of uh, mental uh, disorders and with adult creativity and in infancy, some of what's happening is that that, that ferocious control is, uh, is disappearing, which is a good thing for babies, not a good thing for uh, adults who have to find their way around the world. It's always a very big uh, leap to go from any kind of science to clinical cases, because clinical cases are so complicated. But I do think there may be some evidence now that the kinds of, there's a kind of continuum between schizophrenia and, say, creativity. So, you know, schizophrenia seems to be a kind of occupational hazard of poets, for instance. Um, that there seems to be some connections bet between those things, and those seem to be connected with some of the neurological phenomena that we also see with very young babies. Essentially, not having a lot of top-down control, not having... Uh, Typically, for ad, the way the adult brain works and the aspect of the adult brain that adults are most interested in is that the prefrontal region, which is sort of the brain's head office, you know, where the chief executives are, um, a lot of what goes on in adults is that it shuts down big, enormous other parts of the brain. One of the things that happens when you dream, for instance, is that kind of really ferocious control gets lifted. And... Uh, 
there's a little evidence that at least with some kinds of uh, mental uh, disorders and with adult creativity and in infancy, some of what's happening is that that, that ferocious control is, uh, is disappearing, which is a good thing for babies, not a good thing for uh, adults who have to find their way around the world. John Flavel, who was the great developmental psychologist, one of the greatest ones of the 20th century, said that he would, you know, give everything that he possessed to have just three minutes inside of the head of a baby. Um, and I feel that way too. The trouble is, I probably wouldn't be able to understand a lot of what they were saying, even if they could say it. Um, so I think I'd want to ask them, uh, I'd want to ask them, you know, what's it like? How, what are you seeing at this moment? How many things do you know about? What do you think about the adults around you? But my suspicion is that even if they could talk, probably part of the reason why they aren't talking yet is because what they would say would be in a language that I couldn't quite understand. Mm -hmm.